Hello everyone. So the 24th of February, we've now reached the year anniversary of the special military operation, which was meant to take three days. So in a year of fighting, what's been gained? Well, very little. I'm going to have a look at some key maps of the war at key points, then I'll have a look at some numbers of the losses. So here's the first map, 24th of February. Shows the Russian advance in Kherson, Luhansk, Kharkiv, Sumy, Chernihiv, and Zaitomir, an attempt to circle, isolate, and capture key towns and cities, such as Kherson, Melitopol, Berdyansk, Kiev, Kharkiv. It was a sound strategy on paper, but by the third day already, poor planning and logistical issues were already having an effect on the Russian forces, with many vehicles running out of fuel. This, coupled by Ukraine targeting the supply lines, delayed the offensive. Now I will jump to March 31st. This is a pivotal moment in the war. This is when Russian control over Ukraine was at its peak. So what you're seeing here is the maximum that Russia controlled. So large parts of the north, Chernihiv region, parts of Sumy, big parts of Kharkiv district, Luhansk, most of Zaporizhia to the south, and also most of Kherson district. So at this stage, despite setbacks and logistical issues and delays and quite big losses, it does look like the invasion has been somewhat of a success. So as you can see, over the last month or so, Russia made progress. In some cases, slow progress, but progress nonetheless. Kherson captured, Verdyansk captured, Melitopol captured, large parts of Luhansk captured, Mariupol surrounded, Kharkiv surrounded. These are key cities. The key focus, however, is Kyiv. Russia failed to encircle and blockade the city. Poor logistics and stiff resistance stalled the offensive. On March 22nd, a counter-offensive was launched to drive the Russians away from the city. As Russia started to run out of supplies, they were pushed back as far as 35 kilometers from Kyiv. April 2nd, this was the turning point. Russia, as you can see here, retreated from Kyiv, not just from the outskirts of the city, but from all of northern Ukraine, west of Kharkiv. They would be pushed back even further very soon, by April the 4th, abandoning all offensives in the district of Kyiv completely. Chernihiv, Sumy, Zaitomir, all clear of any Russian presence. This is important, not only for the liberation of Ukrainian territory, but it allows Ukraine to launch drones and missiles from closer to the border, to strike targets within Russia itself. Now, the front lines would remain static for a few months here, Russia on the offensive, making small gains in the south and in the east. But the rapid advances that they saw early on is over. Now, we are talking weeks, even months of combat to capture one small town. I'll skip ahead to the end of May, which pretty much demonstrates that gains now are minor. Zoomed in, we can see they have gains north of Seversk and around the Papazna region. Papasna itself captured on May the 8th. These aren't insignificant, they are key strategic locations and did succeed in putting pressure on Lysychansk, leading to its capture, which we'll see soon. But it's far from what we saw early on, and not without its losses. This is the region where the infamous attempt to cross the Seversky Donetsk River took place, which went badly. So there were heavy losses to capture relatively small bits of territory. We're going to skip ahead to July to see any real movement now. July the 30th, this is pretty much the end of any significant gains by Russia. Severodonetsk and Lysychansk are now captured, and Russia is on the doorsteps of Bakhmut. They remain on the doorsteps of Bakhmut until this day. Severodonetsk and Lysychansk are pretty much the last significant gains by Russia. There's been small settlements and towns captured in the east and south, of course, but nothing of any real significant size in those areas. We are now in February, which just about sums it up. There's been zero major gains for seven months. Instead, all that's been on that time are losses. The next significant date, August the 29th. This is when Ukraine started its counter-offensive in Kherson. At first, progress was slow. Russia's jubilantly showing videos and photos of knocked out Ukrainian columns, including one featuring a number of T-72 tanks donated by Poland in North Kherson. Momentum would quickly change. 
The destruction of vital bridge crossings over the Dnipro meant it was nearly impossible to fully resupply the Russian forces on the western side. The abandonment and liberation of Kherson was clearly on the cards and only a matter of time. But first, Ukraine caught Russia with their kegs down. A counter-offensive in Kharkiv was launched on September 6th and gains were rapid. The front lines of Russia caught entirely by surprise absolutely collapsing. By the 12th of September, Russia had withdrew to the west of the Oskil River. Key cities like Kupiansk and Izium were liberated. This reducing pressure on Ukraine's front lines to the east by removing the threat to the north. There's more to come. The front lines collapsed even further. This time Ukraine capturing the key city of Lehman. This marked the start of the ongoing battles for Svetova and Kremina in the north, which recently have heated up again, with Russia launching an offensive to push Ukraine away from Kremina. Roughly a month after, more good news for Ukraine. The Kherson counter-offensive, which had been fairly static, suddenly burst into life, the Russian front lines again collapsing. Some reports saying that those on the front weren't told the withdrawal was planned until it actually began. The liberation complete on November the 11th, with Russia withdrawing east of the Dnipro. Since then, the front lines have been fairly static. Gains here and there to the east and south for Russia, but nothing to make a song and dance about. Here's the situation as it stands today. So Russia's main gains come in in the east, Luhansk and the rest of Donbass, and in the south, where they still control key cities such as Melitopol, Berdyansk and Mariupol. But have those gains been worth the cost? Personnel? Conservative estimates are 100,000 plus. Some estimates point them at near 150,000. Equipment we can be more specific, thanks to the excellent work by Oryx, who has catalogued any confirmed losses on both sides. This gives a good figure for equipment losses, and bear in mind, this will be on the low side as not every loss is documented. So we're talking 9,393 confirmed vehicles. This includes a massive 1,772 tanks, many of which are T-72s and T-80s making up the bulk. But we also see a good number of older T-62s and modern T-90s. Armoured fighting vehicles, 793 lost including one of the much-hyped BMPT Terminators. Infantry fighting vehicles, 2,118. The number mainly made up of huge numbers of BMPs, including a massive 755 BMP2s. But we also have vehicles like the BMOT and BMD adding to the number. APCs, 298, mostly BTR-80s and BTR-82s. MRAPs and infantry fighting vehicles, fewer losses, 44 MRAPs and 180 infantry mobility vehicles. Ukraine operates the MRAP more than Russia does, thanks to contributions of vehicles like the Mastiff, Wolfhound and Bushmaster. Command vehicles and communications vehicles, 233 lost. These are of course important targets, hampering operations greatly. Engineering vehicles, 283. This includes vehicles such as minesweepers, armoured recovery vehicles, trenchers, excavators and the like. Anti-tank missile systems, 38 lost. We also have 91 artillery support vehicles, so command vehicles and observation vehicles for artillery here, as well as loaders. Towed artillery, I'm surprised that only 176 are listed. I thought this number would be higher. Self-propelled artillery, 348 confirmed as lost the bulk of which is the 2S3 and 2S19. MLRS systems, high losses for vehicles which tend to operate far beyond the front line, 177, the bulk of which are grads. Anti-air equipment, 17 AA guns, all ZU-23-2, 23 self-propelled AA vehicles and 95 SAM systems, which is higher, I believe, than anybody would have expected in February last year. Utility vehicles mainly supply trucks of various sorts. We have 2,302 lost. These are often overlooked, but are extremely important. Ukraine showed early on how hitting the supply lines is an effective tactic that delays and hinders offensive operations. Finally, for ground vehicles, jammers and electronic warfare equipment, we have 25 lost. This includes some counter-UAV systems which were hit by UAVs themselves, 
Aircraft losses are also high, 342. This includes jets, helicopters and drones. Combat jets, we have 68. 25 confirmed Su-25s, the true number is actually higher. I've had on videos on the Su-25 losses which show the crash site, but it couldn't actually be visually confirmed as being a Su-25, so the true number of those could be pushing 30. There are also 18 Su-34s, a modern jet which only entered service in 2014. Helicopters, we have 78. The losses of the Car 52 notably are massive. British intelligence put the number available for operations at around 90, and 30 are visually confirmed as lost. Finally, drones, 192, many of which are the Orland 10. Now naval losses, 11. The famous one being the Moskva, which was sunk by Neptune. But we also have the Saratov landing ship, sunk by Tochkiyu. The same incident damaging the Rapua class landing ship. There's a Cerner listed there which was notably sunk at Snake Island. A Natya class minesweeper hit by unmanned boats at Sevastopol Harbour. Five patrol boats, mainly Raptors hit by Bayraktar. And finally, a victory for the Harpoon, a tug. So, a year of war, and these are very high losses for very little gain, it must be said. All of these losses are just going to mount. You have to wonder how long they can keep up this rate of losses especially as we now must be digging deep into the reserve stock, which, many of, can't be in great condition. Many of these vehicles were pretty poor off the shelf, without being stuck in storage for years. So that's it for this video. I expect through 2023 we'll see Russia's losses mounting. They have made very little gains since Severodonetsk and Lysychansk, though there is much speculation that we may see a renewed offensive soon. So we're going to have to wait and see what the year brings. Hopefully, a swift end to the conflict soon and Crimea back in Ukraine's hands. Thanks for watching and take care everybody.